service today, and if you have your bulletins, let's go ahead and grab those, and inside you're going to find the lyrics to the songs that we're going to sing here this morning. We're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. Let's lift it up on the first together, O Come All Ye Faithful. We'll sing it on the very first, O Come All Ye Faithful. As we remain standing, we're going to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful, on the very first. We'll sing all three, a great song to sing this morning on this December. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of Abraham.
As you find just as you as you remain standing, we're gonna sing the very last. Come to Bethlehem and see. We'll sing it on the very uh, last. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birthday angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord in newborn king. again to Hillcrest Baptist Church and uh, what a wonderful day it is to worship our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, as we sing these songs let's think about the words and sing it as we praise and worship our Savior throughout this morning let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, we'll ask him to bless the time that we have together here today our Father in heaven we thank you so much that we can gather together here today and we can magnify and we can worship the birth of our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ and Father uh, thank you for thy love, thank you for thy grace, and uh, thank you for the awesome plan that you had before the foundation of the world, that you would send your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And Father, this morning we can have hope because of Jesus Christ. We can have peace within our hearts because of our Savior, and we can have joy today because of the promises that we find within the Word of God. And so, Lord, I pray that would be our focus. And I pray, Father, throughout this worship time that you would uh, help us not to be distracted, help us to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And I pray in everything that we do, from the singing uh, to the announcements to the preaching of thy word, that you would be magnified and that you'd be glorified and that you would edify and strengthen us within this process. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this morning. And we pray now that you would bless as we continue singing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, remain standing, and we're going to sing one more song before the message here this morning. And it's going to be Silent Night, Silent Night, Holy Night. And uh, let's lift it up together uh, as, a, as a worship and a praise to the Lord. At this time, teenagers, 7 to 12th graders, you're dismissed to your Bible class. We're going to sing Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm, All is Bright. We'll sing it on the very first as the piano plays on the very first. Think about the words as we sing this song before the message, and we'll sing it on the first. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. Jesus 
stars lend thy light silent night holy night wondrous star lend thy light with the angels let us sing Bibles here this morning. Let's grab our Bibles, and uh, if you're able to, let's remain standing in reference of God's Word, and uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter number two. Matthew chapter number two. And uh, last week we started a brand new uh, Christmas series as we're thinking about the characters of Christmas, the characters of Christmas. And so uh, last week we spoke about Zachariah and uh, Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. And uh, this morning I'd like to speak to you about King Herod. Uh, and the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes, as we find them within the Christmas story. And the next week, we'll speak about Simeon and Anna, the faithful two that waited in the temple uh, for the consolation, the promise of Israel. And so this morning, Herod and the religious leaders, as we look at Matthew chapter number 2, starting in verse number 1 down to verse number 11. The Bible reads in verse number 1, it says, Now when Jesus was born... In Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. These were the Magi, uh, most likely more than three of them, and a large entourage that came from the east uh, to Jerusalem. Verse number two, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art, the, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, this time once again that we can gather together and open up the word of God. And Father, we desperately ask today that you would speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit of God. And Lord, we need thee this morning. Father, we need you every single moment of our lives. And so, Lord, we ask that you would meet with us. We ask, Lord, that you would specifically take the truths that we find within these verses and apply them to our lives individually, personally, that, Lord, we might be able to make some decisions that brings us in a closer walk with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we ask that you would have free course uh, throughout this morning within our hearts. And we pray, Father, everything would be pleasing within thy sight, that you would be pleased and that you would be magnified. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we think about the Christmas story here this morning, the story concerning the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a story that is filled with joy, a story that is filled with peace, and a story that is filled with hope. I think about the announcement of the angels that we find in Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 10. It says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. We find there that this was a message concerning good tidings, concerning that of great joy about the Messiah, uh, concerning the Savior. And then, of course, I think about the response of the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verse number 20. It says, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And then I think about the joyous celebration and the response of faithful Simeon and Anna in the temple in Luke chapter 2, verse number 28. We find the response, first of all, of Simeon. It says, Then took he him up in his arms, speaking about Jesus Christ, and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. And then we find the spirit of thanksgiving when it comes to Anna in verse number 38. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And so as we read throughout the Christmas story, we find that it's a story about joy. It's a story of good tidings that brings peace and hope to every single person. And although this season is the most wonderful time of the year, there are some who still miss that hope. Uh, there are some that fail to have that peace that passeth all understandings, and there are some that lack the joy that comes from our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I think about a character that I think many of us are familiar with. His name is Ebenezer Scrooge, and uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that story. He was a miser. Uh, he was a man that loved his money more than he loved people and others, and uh, we find throughout that story that while others were joyful, uh, he was grouchy, he was grumpy, he was miserable concerning his lot in life. And then, of course, I think about the green character known as the Grinch. And uh, he's the one that steals Christmas from the city of Whoville because he himself is lonely. He himself is a very miserable man. And then, of course, as I think about our passage here this morning, I think about King Herod, and uh, I think about the religious leaders that we find here within these verses. These were the first people that missed out on Christmas. Oh, while everybody else that knew concerning the message of the coming of the Savior were filled with joy and, and gladness and peace and hope, we find that King Herod and the religious leaders, they were filled with arrogance. Uh, they were filled with anger and anxiety, and they were filled with apathy and indifference within their hearts. And this morning, as we study these characters of King Herod and the religious leaders, I want you to notice with me a few thoughts on why they missed out. Uh, why did they not have the joy of the shepherds? Why did they not have the awe uh, of the wise men? Why were they filled with anger? And why were they filled with a spirit of apathy? First of all, as we begin in verse number one, I want you to notice with me that there was a failure to submit to the Lord. Uh, there was a failure to submit to the authority of the Lord. Look at what the Bible says, starting in verse number one, uh, down to verse number three. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, it does not say he was joyous. It does not say that he was relieved. It does not say that he was filled with gladness. But he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, as we spoke about last week concerning the character of Herod, Herod was a cruel man. Uh, Herod was an authoritarian. Herod was a savage leader who was an extremely self-centered narcissist that was paranoid, especially towards the end of his life, uh, concerning those that might threaten and usurp his position and his control. 
and hence we find throughout history that he put to death anybody that would threaten his power, including his wife, uh, including his mother-in-law, and also even his very own children. To give a better picture of how selfish and barbaric and frightful this man was, we think about his final days of his life here upon this earth. During those final moments, he arrested and he imprisoned the most distinguished citizens throughout the city of Jerusalem shortly before his death, and he gave the order to his subordinates that at the moment of his death, at the moment that he breathes his final breath of air here upon this earth, they were commanded to execute all of the distinguished and prominent citizens within the city of Jerusalem. And this was the reason why. Herod knew that he was despised by the people. Uh, Herod knew that, that he was not liked, and he knew that upon his death, nobody would mourn his death. There would be no weeping concerning the death of their leader, and therefore Herod had these distinguished people, the citizens of Jerusalem, executed at the moment of his death so that there would be mourning and weeping throughout the streets of Jerusalem. He did not care that the weeping was not concer concerning himself, he simply wanted the facade and the pretense that there was mourning throughout the city. And so that's the type of merciless and egotistical maniac that Herod was. And therefore we find within the Christmas story when the Magi arrive, uh, when the wise men arrive coming from the east in search of the person who they refer to as the king of the Jews, Herod's reaction was not one of joy, ready to gladly receive the Messiah, but rather we find here it was one of agitation. And the Bible says there that he was greatly troubled within his heart because of the arrival of the Messiah of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to him, it was a threat to his autonomy. Uh, to Herod, it was a threat to his authority because Herod was given the title by the Romans to be the king of the Jews. And see, for some of us here this morning, we might not be as cruel as King Herod was. Uh, for some of us here this morning, we might not be as maniacal as Herod was during the time of his reign, but we too have issues with pride. Uh, we too here this morning have issues of selfishness and and autonomy, and at times we fail to fully submit to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must remember here today that Jesus is not satisfied with simply being a resident within our lives. The desire of our Savior is that he would be president. And for many Christians here this morning, we do not mind making Jesus prominent within our lives. But then when it comes to making Jesus preeminent within our lives, there is a hesitation and a feeling of uneasiness. I don't know about you, but whenever I travel by car, if at all possible, uh, I like to be the driver. Uh, if my wife picks me up from some place and, and she's driving the vehicle, she'll come and she'll park the car. And, and usually 99 times out of 100, she will get out of the driver's seat and move over to the passenger seat and I will get into the driver's seat. It's not because she doesn't like to drive, but it's because I have a desire to drive uh, within that car. And maybe that's for some of you as well here this morning. You have that natural propensity. Uh, you do not mind if other people control your navigation. Uh, you don't mind if other people control your radio, but you want to be the person with your hands on that steering wheel making those decisions on where that vehicle goes. And sometimes if I'm not careful, that type of attitude comes into my relationship with my Savior regarding my life. And I don't mind if Jesus is in my car. As a matter of fact, I want Jesus to be in my car. I don't mind if Jesus is sitting in the passenger seat from time to time giving me directions and advice concerning my life. But when it comes to Jesus putting his hands on the steering wheel of my life and taking absolute control in the driver's seat, at times I'm hesitant. Uh, at times I'm reluctant. Uh, Lord, you could have this section of my life. Lord, you could be in charge of this area of my life. But when it comes to my work, no, Lord, that's my area. I'm in the driver's seat concerning that. When it comes to my marriage, Lord, I'm in control. 
when it comes to my family, when it comes to my finances. Lord, that's my area. That's not a section for you to intrude and to invade. And I need to constantly remind myself that God is always a better driver. And God's desire in my life is not simply to be a passenger, but he desires and requires of each and every one of us that he would be in the driver's seat, that he would have absolute control and authority over every single area of our lives. I think about what Leonard Ravenhill said many years ago. He said, God does not want partnership with us, but ownership of our lives. And you see here today, until we submit and make the Lord truly the Lord of our lives in every aspect, we will never know and experience the joy and the peace that comes from surrendering all, from surrendering everything to the authority, to the power of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, Herod was threatened. Uh, Herod was a man that, that thrived on his self-autonomy. He thrived in his position. He thrived concerning his authority. He was always in control. And therefore, when Jesus came on the scene, he was threatened that he would usurp his autonomy and his authority. And I pray here this morning that would not be our spirit. And I pray this morning that would not be our attitude but rather we would be willing and humble to surrender and submit everything at the feet of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I find here there was a failure to submit to the Lord. But then I want you to notice, secondly, why else did they miss the blessings of Christmas? I find that there was a failure to seek after the Lord. Now, we only find a, a few verses concerning the, the chief priests. Uh, and the scribes here, but I believe according to these verses, we can deduce something about their spirit and their attitude. It says in verse number four, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And so we know from that verse that these chief priests and these scholars, they were students uh, of the Old Testament scriptures. Obviously, they understood the prophecy uh, given in Micah chapter number five, for they quote it here in verse number six, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And so I want us to think about that just for a moment. You see the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes in that day knew the prophecies of the Old Testament. Uh, they, they were not oblivious to the truth concerning the coming Messiah. On top of that, they knew what the arrival of the Messiah meant. They, they knew what the blessings were. They knew what the promises entailed concerning the coming of the Son of David, the Son of God, who would be the Son of God. And so they knew the prophecies. They knew the meaning of the coming of the Messiah. They also knew where the locality of the the look of the place where Jesus would be born according to the prophet Micah he would be born in the city of Bethlehem and Bethlehem as we think about the geography uh, of Palestine was only and is only six miles away from the city of Jerusalem look for them this was the event of the year uh, for those that were studying the Old Testament scriptures, I mean, this was the event of the century. I mean, the Messiah had arrived. He was born in the city of Bethlehem, and he wasn't 600 miles away or even 60 miles away. He was only six miles away, yet we do not find anywhere recorded within the Bible that these chief priests and their scribes left the comfort of Jerusalem and sought after the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe there were other circumstances that restricted them to do so. I don't know. But ultimately, the underlying reason, I believe, was that they had become indifferent. I believe in the comfort of their position and their authority, they had become apathetic, and they had become careless concerning the arrival of the Messiah. And likewise for us this morning, the natural tendency is to grow indifferent and disinterested concerning the truths and the promises of Christmas. 
and we grow apathetic when it comes to our personal relationship with the reason for the season, which is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, just like every other relationship within our lives, our relationship with Jesus Christ must be cultivated. It must be pursued. It does not simply grow on its own. It doesn't automatically move towards a healthy relationship and a love relationship and in growing fellowship, but we must pursue after our Savior, and we must strive to walk with Him daily, and we must seek Him with all of our hearts and that is the command in the bible and that is the yearning desire of the lord for each and every one of us here this morning the bible says in proverbs 8 17 i love them that love me and those that seek me early shall find me in matthew 6 33 we know this promise but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you it says seek ye first pursue come after the lord jesus christ in jeremiah 29 verse number 13 and he shall seek me and find me when he shall search for me with all your heart and you see throughout the christmas season and every season of life let me encourage each and every one of us as believers of the lord jesus christ as christians that have been saved by the blood of the lamb let us not get apathetic and let us not become indifferent but let us personally seek after the lord and spend much time in the presence of our savior and you see during this season we spend a lot of time in a lot of different areas uh, we might have to spend a lot of time at work because of just all the changes that are taking place uh, concerning uh, our circumstances. We might spend a lot of time shopping for presents, whether that's physically uh, at a mall or whether that's online on a website. We might spend extra time watching holiday movies. Uh, we might spend extra time uh, planning for the new year. We might spend extra time uh, at gatherings and parties with our family and friends. We might spend extra time uh, in a myriad of different appointments and commitments that we might have throughout this season. But my question to each and every one of us is, are we spending time to seek the Lord? Are we spending time at the feet of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? For He is the reason concerning the joy and the hope and the blessedness concerning this season and concerning our lives as a Christian, as a child of God. And I wonder here today, have you sought the Lord this morning? Did you take time throughout the busyness of getting ready for church and getting ready uh, to, to gather your family and come out to this parking lot? Did you pause and spend time to seek the Lord? I wonder, as you look back on the past seven days, did you seek after your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? We know where he can be found. Uh, we have the scriptures within our hands. He's not far away. He's close to each and every one of us. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit of God indwells each and every one of us. But did you seek after him? Did you spend time with your Savior throughout this past week? You see, for the chief priests and the scribes, the most important thing for them to have done at that very moment was to drop everything, to put a complete pause on their busy schedule and follow the wise men to Bethlehem to seek after the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. That would have been the most important and the most beneficial thing that they could have done. Yes, I'm sure they had busy temple meetings. I'm sure they had different responsibilities. I'm sure they had appointments and commitments. I'm sure they had different gatherings that they needed to attend. But the most important thing for them was to seek out the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And could I say here this morning, the most important and the most beneficial thing that we can do every single day, not only in this season, but also throughout the rest of our lives, is to seek after the Lord Jesus Christ. That might mean we have to cancel some appointments within our schedule. Uh, that might mean that we have to wake up a, a little bit earlier to get alone, maybe 
in front of the fireplace or to get alone uh, at the corner of our dining table or to get alone under the patio outside and to grab our Bibles and to spend time in prayer, to spend time in, in singing and worshiping, praising the Lord, and to spend time studying the scriptures and seeking out the Lord Jesus Christ and growing in our passion and our communion and our vision for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the most important and the most beneficial thing that we can do every single day. When it comes to this subject, I'm always reminded and convicted by the story of, of Martha and Mary. Martha was cumbered about with work. She had important company. Jesus Christ was in her midst. And so she was busy in the kitchen. Uh, she was busy preparing the food. She was busy preparing the table. She was busy organizing what would take place throughout that day as they hosted the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples. She was doing a good thing, but she was not doing the best thing. And oftentimes we sacrifice the best for the good things. And the best thing that we can do is to spend time with Jesus every single day. The Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 41, And Jesus answered and said unto Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled, agitated, about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I want you to notice what Jesus said. He didn't say uh, that it was the beneficial thing, although it was beneficial. Uh, he didn't say that it was the helpful thing, although it was helpful, but Jesus said it is the needful thing. You're busy. You're cumbered about with so many responsibilities, and they're good. They're not wrong. They're not sinful. But he says, Martha, you've missed the one thing that is needful. You've missed the one thing that is necessary. You've missed the one thing that is required of thee. But Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. She's spending time at the feet of her Savior. You know, when I was a younger Christian, I used to think, I have so many things that I must do for Jesus. And for me, if you know my testimony, I was saved a little bit later, although I grew up in a Christian home. I was saved when I was 22 years old. And to be honest with you, as soon as I got saved, the thought kept coming in within my mind, uh, I've wasted so much time. Uh, I'm already 22. I don't have that much time left on this earth. I need to do so much for my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I was younger, that was the thought that, uh, that really uh, uh, controlled my mind, that I have so many things to do for Jesus, I don't have time to spend time with Jesus. But as I got older in my Christianity and my faith, I slowly began to learn that I still have so many things to do for Jesus. That has not changed. But because of that, I must first sit down and spend much time with Jesus Christ. For I realized it is my time with the Lord that makes my service for the Lord productive and effective. And likewise, for each and every one of us, it's the time that we spend with the Lord that allows our marriage to be productive, to be effective. It's the time that we spend with the Lord that allows us to be profitable when it comes to the different responsibilities that we have within this life. And the lie of the devil is you have so much to do, skimp on your devotions. Skimp on your time with the Lord. You can't spend an hour. You can't spend 90 minutes with Jesus Christ. You have, you have so many things on your to-do list. It's impossible. Take 10 minutes, take 15 minutes, and then get going and get the things done. And that's the deception of the devil. For the truth is, if we don't spend time with Jesus, we're never going to be profitable in all the other things that we need to do throughout our lives. It's all in vain and it's futile without the needful thing, which is to spend time at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, failing to seek after the Lord 
is like trying to drive a car without gas. I don't know if you, any of you have tried that before. It's not going to work. Uh, you, you could have the fanciest car. You, you could have a car that, that's over $100,000 with all the, all the bells and whistles. But if you don't have gas, I might have to say as well in this generation, if you don't have electricity, right, we do have hybrids and others, that car's going nowhere. You see, if we live our life without seeking the Lord, it's like trying to navigate a sailboat without wind. It's like trying to operate your phone without batteries. What we desperately need is fuel. What we desperately need is a gust of air. And what we desperately need is a charger. And that which is needful in life is time with the Lord. It just might be if we spend more time with Jesus seeking after him, and being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, then the Lord will change us, and the Lord will take care of the other problems that we might have within this life. Our marriage, our family, our job, our finances, our health, whatever the case might be, it just might be if we spend more time with Jesus, He will help us to be more profitable in all those other areas of our lives. And unlike the religious leaders, we must realize the importance and the needfulness of seeking the Lord. And so there's a failure to submit to the Lord. There was a failure to seek after the Lord. And then there was a failure to worship the Lord. And notice lastly in verse number seven, uh, down to the end of our passage, it says, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, Herod gave a pretense of a desire to worship the Lord but it was superficial with ulterior motives, whereas the wise men fell on their faces before Christ. They gave him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, acknowledging his sovereignty and his authority and his deity. And I pray throughout this season that our worship of Almighty God would not simply be a facade of something that moves our lips, but it'd be more than that, truly something that moves our hearts to magnify the Lord, to ascribe worth unto Him, and to acknowledge that Jesus is King, to acknowledge that He is the Lord, to acknowledge He is the great Sovereign that rules over everything. And let me encourage each and every one of us here this morning, worship services don't have to take place on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and during a midweek gathering. Could I say here today, every time that you're alone with the Lord Jesus Christ, that ought to be a time that you personally worship the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord himself is preaching to you through the word of God. The Holy Spirit is ministering to your heart. And I want to encourage you, get alone throughout this season and, uh, and focus your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will cause uh, everything else to begin to disappear concerning the problems and the circumstances of this world as you focus on his birth, as you focus on his promises, as you sing from your heart the praise and the worship to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, it will fill you with joy and peace and hope once again concerning the promises that we find within the Bible. I don't know about you, but but uh, earlier this week I was, I was uh, uh, up in the morning doing my devotions. And uh, my custom is, and, and oftentimes I kind of switch it up just so that it doesn't become, uh, just so that I don't become too used to that environment of where I'm doing my devotions with the Lord. And, and, uh, but as of right now, it's at my dining table in the kitchen, and, and uh, I get out there and I'll, I'll read the scriptures and, and uh, write down some things on my journal about what the Lord has spoken to my heart about. And, and then I'll grab the hymnal, and uh, this is where I go. I go to my garage. And uh, you say, why do you go to your garage? Because I don't want anybody else to hear me singing. And uh, I don't want to wake up my children and my wife uh, with my singing in the morning. And so I grab my hymnal and, and go to my garage. And, and uh, earlier this week, I just wanted to sing through some of the Christmas songs and, and just some of the truths concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and his birth. And uh, I remember I came to one 
uh, one song that maybe we don't sing too often here in church, but I think we ought to. And uh, and it is uh, the title is uh, 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 He is Christ the King. And uh, and it speaks about the fact that that He's the Lord, that He's the coming King, uh, that we ought to worship Him, that we ought to magnify Him. And, uh, and, and I'll just be transparent and honest with you. Man, I just had revival in my heart that morning uh, within that garage. If you stepped in there, you'd be thinking, you know, Pastor, you're crazy. What's going on with you right now? But, but the Lord was just touching my heart concerning that truth. And to be honest with you, there were some things that I was bothered about with what's going on with our society and what's going on in Washington, D.C. And, and just the future of this nation. And, and there are just some things that were laying heavy on my heart. And that morning, the Lord reminded me, wait a minute, your faith and your hope is not in this life. And it's not in this government. It's not in this country. But it's in the kingdom to come is the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like Jesus appeared in that manger in Bethlehem, fulfilling the promises and the prophecies throughout the scriptures. Likewise, Jesus will fulfill his promise concerning the coming kingdom, that he will return. He is the soon and coming king. He will establish his throne. He will rule with a rod of iron in righteousness. And we as believers, as the church, as the bride of Christ, will rule with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that truth within that song encouraged and strengthened me that morning as I spent time to worship the Lord. Now I want to encourage you throughout this season, get alone, grab your Bible, grab a journal, grab a hymnal, put your phone aside, put your tablet aside, and spend some time worshiping your Savior. And He will renew and revive your heart and he will help us to be realigned to the joy and the peace and the hope that comes from this season. I'm afraid there's a, there's a lot of Christians, especially this year, they're missing out on the blessings of Christmas. They're missing out on the joy and the hope and the peace that comes throughout this season because they're failing to submit to the Lord. They're failing to surrender all and lay everything at the foot of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they're failing when it comes uh, to the area of seeking out the Lord. They're being, they're being indifferent and apathetic. And they're failing in the area of worshiping the Lord. Corporately, and then could I say more importantly, personally, privately worshiping our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe if we would renew our worship, we would revive our seeking after the Lord, and we would revive our submission to the Lord, then God will fill us once again with joy and peace and the hope that can only come from the truth and the promises concerning our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, I encourage each and every one of us that we would not be like Herod. We would not be like the religious leaders. But let us be like the wise men. Let us be like the shepherds. Let us be like Simeon and Anna, those who experience the blessings of the Christmas story. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. And we pray now that you'd speak to our hearts. Father, there's a lot going on. It's been very different this year. But, Lord, the promises have not changed. And, Lord, you're still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I pray in the busyness of this season, in all the distractions and the trappings of this season, I pray, Lord, that we would not fail in these three areas. That, Lord, we would not fail to submit unto thee our lives, everything, at the feet of our Savior. Uh, that, Lord, we would not fail when it comes to seeking after Thee. That we'd be faithful to seek and to hunger after righteousness, to hunger after the things of the Lord. And then, Father, we would not neglect and fail to worship our Savior corporately and then privately, personally. To spend time, to be reminded once again concerning the character and the attributes 
of our God and to exalt and ascribe worth unto thee. Lord, I pray that you stir us up once again. Lord, I pray that we would not miss out on the blessings, especially concerning this Christmas season. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, uh, just for a moment here today, as the piano plays, I wonder here this morning, are you joyful? It's a simple question. But I want you to ask that question to yourself privately and answer it honestly. Are you joyful this morning? Do you have peace and rest this morning? Or are you troubled and agitated like Herod was? Do you have hope this morning? Does it excite you that Jesus Christ is coming again? Does it excite you that none of his promises fail? That God is the same? That God will establish his kingdom? And does that compel you to worship the Lord? If not, it might be this morning that you are failing in one of these areas. To submit, to seek, and to worship. And I want to encourage you that you would renew your submission and surrender to the Lord. That you would revive throughout this week. I want to encourage you, this is very practical, but if you would say today, well, my, my seeking after the Lord, it, it's, it's been hit or miss this past week. Really, for this past month, I haven't really spent much time at the feet of Jesus. I've been more like Martha than Mary. Then I encourage you, once the service is done, go home, grab a Bible, get alone in solitude, and spend a good amount of time reading, worshiping, singing, praying. Spend time at the feet of Jesus. And then get your calendar out, whatever you use, and block off time. Tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. This is the hour. This is the time. No matter what happens, this is reserved for me and my Savior. Spend that time every day. And I believe with all my heart, you will begin to see the joy and the hope and the peace being restored once again within your life. Maybe there's somebody here this morning and, and you don't know that hope. The reason why is because you personally have never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior. I wonder here today, if you were to die this morning, you know for certain heaven's your home. That's why Jesus was born. He came to live a sinless life and then to die as a sacrifice for our sins, that we might be saved. And this morning, if you don't know Jesus, you don't know for certain that heaven would be your home, I encourage you, would you place your faith in Jesus Christ? Trust Him. It's not through your works of righteousness. It's only by God's mercy that one can be saved. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure about that. If that's you, I encourage you, once this service is over, come find me or email us if you're watching through live stream, text us, reach out to us, and we'd like to show you how you can know for certain that Jesus is your Savior, and you have the hope of heaven. The piano's going to play just for a little bit longer. Once again, ask those questions. Am I joyful this morning? Do I have peace? Do I have hope? might say, well, the pandemic. No, that's not the problem. You might say, well, the government. No, that's not the problem. In every season of life, no matter what's going on around us, we can have joy, peace, and hope in Jesus Christ. That's what makes Christians different from the world. We have a Savior that we can trust.
our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for thy word. Lord, what a wonderful time of the year it is. Lord, as we think about the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's such an encouragement to know that God was manifested in the flesh, that you lived a sinless life, then you died on the cross to save us, to redeem us, to set us free from the bondage of sin and this world, that we might set our eyes not on the things that are temporal, but on the things that are eternal and spiritual. And so, Lord, I pray here this morning that you'd help us to live by faith and help us throughout this season to not miss the blessings of Christmas. Help us not to emulate the attitude and the spirit of Herod and the chief priests. But Lord, help us to submit, help us to seek, and help us to spend much time in worship of our Savior. Father, we thank you for this morning, and we pray now that you would guide us and bless the rest of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, thank you so much for being here this morning. And uh, before we dismiss, we like to do something quickly, and, and we're not going to uh, take a long time. Uh, but we always have what's called the, the state of the church, and that takes place uh, always on the first or the second Sunday of December. And uh, we usually do that on Sunday night because there's a lot of things that we cover when it comes to uh, just what took place throughout this year, and just some of the uh, just some of the statistics and the blessings, and a little bit about the vision, and a little bit about the finances moving forward for next year. And uh, we usually do that throughout the Sunday evening service, and take maybe about an hour, hour.